Welcome everyone. This is the first workshop in the 2022 New York State World Languages Professional Learning Series. My name is Candace Black and I am your World Language Associate in the Office of Bilingual Education and World Languages at the New York State Education Department. I want to welcome you to Understanding Vocabulary Development in Standards-Based Teaching. Vocabulary knowledge is the key to communication. No one can understand or be understood without it. In this session, participants will examine the role of vocabulary learning in proficiency development and explore the importance of vocabulary development in designing and implementing thematic units. Participants will learn research-informed strategies for identifying, presenting, and spiraling vocabulary to facilitate acquisition. Let's review a few housekeeping details before we get started. We have almost 600 pre-registered uh, participants today, so we ask that you remain muted and that you reserve use of the chat for questions for the presenters or for when the presenters specifically instruct participants to use this feature. If you accidentally get disconnected, just reconnect or call me and I will assist you. My cell is on the confirmation email I sent you yesterday. I'm going to enter the link to the handouts folder in the chat. In this folder, you will find the revised standards, the themes and topics, proficiency targets and performance indicators, crosswalks, unit planning templates and exemplars, as well as a unit audit document. The PDF of the presentation will be added to this folder at the end of the workshop. Within 24 hours of this event, those who attend this workshop in full will receive either a certificate of attendance or a certificate documenting CTLE credit. The type of certificate you will be receiving was indicated in the confirmation email you received after you registered. This workshop is being recorded. The video will be uploaded to the World Languages Professional Webinar page and people who watch it will be able to earn CTLE credit by viewing the video and answering 7 out of 10 questions on a post-assessment correctly. We generally upload the video within about a week of the original event. Before I introduce our presenters, I'd like to thank the following individuals for their help in assisting with this workshop. Kimberly Harder, Louisa Mota, Barbara Patterson, Eris Thompson, and Yun Xiao Zhang. Our workshop presenters today are Dr. Joanne O'Toole, Dr. Lori Langer de Ramirez, and Bill Heller. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to invite Joanne, Lori, and Bill to begin this workshop. Thank you, Candy, and welcome back, those of you who have attended our events, and th welcome to those of you who are here for the first time. We want to start by reminding you about the other upcoming um, professional learning opportunities this spring. You'll see on this slide, we have a two part session around grammar on February 24th and March 3rd. Standards based lesson planning on March 31st. Understanding standards based curriculum planning on May 19th. Each one of those webinars is from 4 to 5 p.m. You can register on the state um, OBEWL website professional learning page and CTLE credit is available for all of those sessions and of course all sessions just like this one are being recorded so make sure you mark those dates on your calendar and we will see you there. I also want to take just a moment to remind you of the Wakelet it's a curation site that includes multiple authentic resource collections because in each one of our webinars we refer to the use of authentic materials and people often ask where do i find them well we've been busy curating these for you so please make sure you visit this this site is also linked on the professional learning web page so again our session is entitled understanding vocabulary development in standards-based teaching, and I will get us started. A few of our symbols to guide our work today, keeping your microphone muted, so thank you to all of you who are muted. Think alone when you see this blue thought bubble. You don't need to enter anything into the chat, but it's just a moment for reflection or to um, think about something that we're going to be presenting to you. 
There will be a time at the end of this session when we have the chat symbol and we ask you to enter into the chat um, your questions, your thinking. We do ask you, I'm just going to repeat what Candy said, please don't be communicating via the chat for any purpose other than to enter a question during the session so that all of the participants can stay focused. We will answer the questions at the end. And then you'll see the little Google folder icon because as Candy pointed out, there's a handouts folder associated with this session. And if you just logged on, that link will be submitted throughout the session in the chat, um, where what we're showing on the screen will also be available to you in that Google folder. So let's get started. We have four goals for today. The first one being, I can identify what it means to know vocabulary. Then secondly, I can plan for vocabulary development through classroom communication. Third, I can plan for vocabulary development at the unit level. And finally, I can plan for vocabulary development through strategy instruction and intentional recycling. So you see the blue thought bubble. I'd like you to take a moment to reflect on this question. What does it mean to know a word? Take just a moment. Now check your thinking against this list. Meanings. It means knowing not only how a word is defined, but the many possible ways it can be defined. Connotations. Is this word a negative word? Is it a positive word? What is its suggested meaning that could even vary across contexts and cultures? The part of speech which is really critical to know for knowing where you can use that word and how you can use it. The frequency of use, is it a common word? Is it the one that a native speaker would typically use? Or might it be an obscure word that a native speaker would be surprised to hear somebody using? What are the contexts within which this particular word is typically used? And collocations, what are the words that go next to it? Pronunciation, spelling, and even the usage. When is this word most appropriately used socially, culturally, syntactically? So I'd like you to think about the idea that knowing a word is really a multi-part task. And so we have to keep that in our minds when we think about our vocabulary instruction. What is it that we want our students to know about any given word or phrase or collection of words. Vocabulary is often referred to as the key to successful communication. And here's three different quotes that explain that idea. Starting with Curtin and Dahlberg's quote, vocabulary is the essential foundation for communication in the second language. Lightbone and Spada say, we can communicate by using words that are not placed in the proper order, that are not pronounced perfectly or marked with the proper grammatical morphemes, but communication often breaks down if we do not use the correct word. And Wilkins, cited in Clementi and Terrell, said this, while without grammar, very little can be conveyed, without vocabulary, nothing can be conveyed. Some really important ideas for understanding how key, how essential vocabulary is to communication. So what is vocabulary? Well. We're going to take a look at it in three overarching categories, single words, phrases, and idioms. So starting with single words, 
these constitute the bulk of the vocabulary that exists in a language. And clearly, they're the most frequently used elements of vocabulary. Even though we refer to them as single words, they may be individual or they may be compound in nature. Think of this example, thunder, thunderstorm. I'm sure you can think of many examples. Phrases consist of more than one word. And they may be fixed. So think about this example from head to toe. We don't go around saying in English from toe to head or from neck to toe. The expression is fixed from head to toe. There are other kinds of phrases that are variable. So think of this example. Oh, it tastes like watermelon. It sounds like thunder. It looks like a shiny penny. We can substitute these different sensory verbs, in, but within this phrase. Or phrases can serve as formulaic chunks, words that are clustered together in their use. So for example, I have to. I have to go. I have to come. I have to do my homework. I have to eat. We're going to take a little bit closer look at formulaic chunks. You may actually be familiar with this concept by a different name. So I've listed some of those formulaic language, functional chunks, lexical phrases, fabricated language, and there's probably more. And again, our example from the previous slide is, I have to. Functional chunks are unanalyzed chunks of language. So what do I mean by unanalyzed? Unanalyzed means that the learners don't know necessarily what parts of speech these are, what the grammatical um, manipulation to a verb might be. So it's just language taken as a whole without really knowing the individual elements of it. And these unanalyzed chunks that constitute formulaic chunks communicate meaning and complete ideas. And they're useful in multiple contexts. So again, looking at that example, I have to, I can use that all over the place for many different purposes. But they're stored in the memory as whole units. So the learner, for example, with I have to, doesn't know that it's first person singular as the subject pronoun, followed by the present tense of the verb to have, followed by um, the preposition to. They don't need to know that. They just know, I have to. And because it's stored in memory as a whole unit, it can be retrieved as if it were a single word and retrieved very quickly, which reduces the learner's cognitive load. So in other words, in how, in, in, Bill, I need my click. <laughs> um, instead of having to figure out and take the time to put all of the linguistic pieces together, like these individual Legos. The learners have one piece that communicates meaning that they can retrieve very quickly. And the third category of vocabulary, again, overarching category, is idioms. And idioms are expressions in which the sum of the individual word meanings do not equal the meaning of the whole expression. So think about the idiom, idiom in English. The plan is up in the air, up in the air, right? It doesn't mean this. <laughs> Literally, it's not up, it's not in, and it's not the air. Instead, this idiom means that something's unsettled or uncertain or unresolved. And so all of these are really important 
portions of our instruction to our learners when they're learning vocabulary for the different reasons identified. So I'd like you to take a moment to think about this quote regarding learning a word or phrase or idiom. Learning a new word is not just a factor of how many times a learner encounters a word referred to typically as incidental learning, but it is more a factor of how often the learner is able to use the new word in a meaningful context or intentional learning. In other words, meaning and meaningfulness are critical to vocabulary acquisition. We know frequency matters, but frequency without meaningfulness doesn't help learners acquire vocabulary. So now moving on to our second goal, we're going to be thinking about classroom communication as a place where we can plan for our students' vocabulary instruction. A classroom that's filled with talk creates an ideal environment for vocabulary learning. So let's take a closer look at this idea. Of course, classroom talk with the vocabulary that's used in it must be made comprehensible before our students can acquire it. And that image you see is the High Leverage Teaching Practice, Volume 1, Enacting Language Instruction, High Leverage Teaching Practices. And High Leverage Teaching Practice no number one is referred to as facilitating target language comprehensibility. Let me take a moment to remind you what high leverage teaching practices are. These are the practices that are specific to our field, our field of world language education that research has shown have the most powerful impact on students learning in our field. And facilitating target language comprehensibility is number one for a reason. As the authors state, it is the foundation upon which all language instruction occurs. So if we think back to vocabulary, as being about the foundation upon which language learning occurs, well, then we have to start by making it comprehensible to learners. So we're going to take a look at three categories of practices that are associated with high leverage teaching practice number one, facilitating target language comprehensibility, and some of what are referred to as the small grain practices. These are the strategies that you as teachers probably use on a regular basis, but want to make sure you're being very intentional about in your instruction for promoting vocabulary acquisition. So this first category is referred to as creating comprehensible language. So think about which of these do you do? Do you paraphrase new words and expressions? Do you define new words and expressions with examples when you introduce them in classroom talk? Do you slow down your rate of speech so learners can hear where one word begins and ends? Sometimes it's in that speech stream without pause or interruption that learners can't access a word. Do you use and build on the vocabulary and structure students already know? When you're using new words or expressions, do you use those multiple times and, of course, meaningfully? And do you signal new words or structures with a particular tone of voice that really calls your students' attention to them? And do you make sure that you're connecting your discourse so that you're creating a meaningful context from which the students can extract that meaning? 
So this first category is the most robust set of strategies, but it's also the one that most helps learners acquire vocabulary in your classroom talk. In the second category, a few of the small grain practices are specific to supporting vocabulary acquisition, such as using gestures. I bet that's something that you do regularly. Or how about using visuals and concrete objects? And while, while there are more small grain practices, these are the two that are very particularly associated with vocabulary acquisition. But I want to take a moment to note something about the visuals and the concrete objects and how important they are when you're trying to communicate cultural meaning. Because cultural meanings aren't always able to be defined in translatable terms. Because we know there are words in the languages we teach that like they're just not that equivalent in English. And that's why visuals and concrete objects can be so powerful. They can illustrate cultural practices. So think about the French kiss, the Japanese business card, or the cultural products such as Peruvian potatoes or French bread. The image that our students are going to have in their mind will come from their own cultural lenses unless we use visuals and concrete objects to help them interpret that cultural meaning. And the third of the categories that's associated with high leverage teaching practice number one is creating context for comprehension. And again, I'd like you to think about which of these you use, these small grain practices. And again, I've only included the ones that really are associated with vocabulary acquisition. And they are checking students' comprehension. So we've used those new words. Are the students comprehending them? Cueing students to say those recurrent words and phrases in their discourse part of the application process. And providing useful expressions and phrases, there's our functional chunks. And again, there are more small grain practices, but they're not all associated with vocabulary acquisition. So moving beyond the classroom communication and thinking about our unit level planning, here are a few ideas to consider related to vocabulary as you engage in unit planning. Let's start by looking at the standards. And again, these are in your folder. What elements of the standards help us know as teachers what vocabulary we should be teaching? Well, we want to teach vocabulary that's related to the context. And as we know, every one of the standards has some statement in it, some wording in it that identifies the context. So for example, in standard one, variety of topics. What are those topics? Oh yes, we have New York State world language themes and topics. And in interpersonal communication, the information that we want our students to be exchanging. And again, in presentational communication, we again see the variety of topics. And when we look at our culture standards, it's the vocabulary that's going to be associated with the cultures studied. So again, thinking back to our high leverage teaching practices, thinking to our themes and topics, those are the ideas that we want to hold on to when we think about the context of vocabulary, the vocabulary that we select for our instruction. And a last piece that can really guide our thinking about the vocabulary that we select for our students in our unit planning can be informed by the Actful Proficiency Guidelines. 
So we're going to take a look at three slides, one for novice level proficiency, one for intermediate, and one for advanced. And thinking back to our webinar on proficiency and performance, you may recall that one of the elements of every proficiency descriptor is context. And for novice level learners, that context is highly predictable everyday topics. So we want to make sure that the vocabulary that we're using, the vocabulary that we're teaching our students is highly predictable. It's related to highly predictable everyday topics. And what vocabulary can we expect our students to be able to express and understand? The proficiency guidelines tell us that as well from speaking, isolated words and phrases, writing, words and phrases, listening, keywords, true oral cognates, and formulaic expressions. And in reading, novice learners can understand keywords and cognates, formulaic phrases. Looking at the intermediate level of proficiency, the context, familiar topics related to daily life. So the vocabulary needs to be vocabulary associated with familiar topics in daily life. And then what is it that they can understand and produce? In speaking, vocabulary that's influenced by the first language. In writing, the guidelines refer to basic vocabulary. And in listening and reading, high frequency vocabulary. And when we move to the advanced level of proficiency, the context expands. Autobiographical topics, as well as topics of community, national, international interests. So your units are going to expand, as will the vocabulary that um, you're going to be preparing your students to acquire. And how well will they understand and produce it? Well, speaking and writing, we see generic vocabulary. Listening, lexically uncomplicated, and in reading, uncomplicated. So I'm going to turn it over to Bill at this point. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. So in the unit plan template that you'll also find in the um, resource folder that we talked about in the previous um, webinar, we've identified target vocabulary in the section called the toolbox. Here's the part of the unit plan template that talks about the toolbox. So we see um, a place for you to put the groups of language that you are needed to enact the language functions that you've identified in already in your uh, can do statements. Usually you'll list these as groups, but you can also see that sometimes you'll also include um, those meaningful chunks as part of your supporting language structures. Your supporting vocabulary groups will bring out the context and of the theme and your structures will help you your students enact the language functions that you've identified in your can do statements. So the unit context and theme are, are, are word groups, the language functions are functional chunks. So here's an example of what you might put on a sample checkpoint a, a unit plan. Our context would be how would people choose to spend their time. Our language function is to express likes and dislikes. So in order to do that, we might be introducing leisure time activities as our vocabulary. We might recycle school subjects that we may have already talked about and use that to talk about likes and dislikes. And we might introduce time expressions like always, sometimes, never. And in our language structures, we can use the chunks of language to express I like, he likes, she likes, and don't and doesn't, and just teach them as, as language chunks without necessarily going into the whole uh, grammar of the, the, the forms uh, that are necessary. We just give those as single chunks, as uh, Joanne had talked about before. But these chunks help us to enact the um, 
language functions of expressing likes and dislikes. So we have our supporting vocabulary, and then we can identify as vocabulary as well any of those language chunks that um, are uh, can be considered vocabulary. So what vocabulary do we consider for our toolbox? So in thinking about what specific vocabulary to include, understand that you'll want to include three different types of vocabulary. The first is vocabulary for, in, for, for production. This will be a smaller group of high frequency vocabulary that you will expect most students to be able to produce in speaking and writing. These are the key words that students will use repeatedly throughout the unit and will be also of high value in subsequent units. The second group is a little larger group, the vocabulary for recognition. You want students to be able to recognize the meaning of these words in reading and in listening tasks, but not necessarily expect them to produce them on their own. These will be words that the learners encounter regularly in interpretive activities, but not necessarily required for production. And the third group uh, will be unique to each learner, their personalized vocabulary. Those are words that individual students wish to know so that they will be able to truly create with the language to talk about their own reality and uh, themselves. For example, every learner might not need to learn the word for skateboard, but for kids who, for whom that's their passion, they'll certainly need that word to communicate about their own interests. So those become their personalized vocabulary list. Now, what are the criteria for selecting these vocabulary for production and recognition? There are four qualities we might consider based on what the work of Wilfong. First of all, vocabulary that's representative. In other words, is the vocabulary critical to understanding the theme? Does it give our expand our context that we need to explore our inquiry question for the unit? Is it repeatable? Will it be used often it, within the unit? And then will it be a useful word for them to have for subsequent units to build upon? Is it transportable? Will the vocabulary be needed by learners to communicate? In other words, not just to receive it, but also to output. And then is it manageable? Is this the highest priority vocabulary? In other words, to avoid too much cognitive overload. Are, are we prioritizing what's really important, what's really high frequency, what's really high usage? At this point, I'd like to say a few words in praise of the sometimes maligned vocabulary list. I like to create a target language vocabulary list for every unit. It's a carefully curated tool. Call it a portable word wall, if you will. I found that providing a target language list of vocabulary can highlight the purposefulness of words and phrases for the learners. It creates a word bank for frequent reference and use to promote the repetition and acquisition. And this is not just for the students, but for me to keep these high frequency words in my head so that I'm constantly using them and incorporating them in the input that I provide. And also giving them that um, word bank, if you will, decreases the temptation to use translators because they've got a list of words in front of them that they can already draw from. Now, like any tool, a vocabulary list can be used well or badly, as long as we see it as a reference tool more than a teaching tool. I think it's worth the time in order to clarify for ourselves and for our students the vocabulary that are most important to keep using throughout the unit and also to for ourselves to sort out what do we want them to be able to produce what versus what do we want them to be able to uh, understand and receive. Now, of course, the learners first encounter new vocabulary through the input the teacher provides through various interpretive activities that we can base on, of course, authentic resources. How we sequence our interpretive activities can ensure maximum support for comprehension of new vocabulary. Here's an example in French of a document which identifies the venues for the 2024 Olympic Games in Paris. It's an infographic with few words and lots of graphic support to introduce a variety of sports. Here's a close up of the key to that document. We can see many cognates of English 
and others are easily decoded with the use of the graphics. We can use all of the good before, during, and after strategies that we've discussed in previous webinars relating to interpretive communication standard one to help learners understand, interpret, and analyze this document. Some of the words on this graphic will be on our list of production vocabulary. Many more will be for recognition only, and still others might find their way onto individual learners' personalized lists. This document then can be used as a reference for interpersonal conversations with the help of some simple sentence frames. Here's an example for a German uh, checkpoint A unit with an anchor topic relating to education on the cultural custom of the Schultute given to German kids on the first day of first grade. The graphic gives some great visual support for understanding and talking about the common contents of the Schultute and how much parents or grandparents spend on them. And again, it's a very simple word level with graphical representation. Here's an example in Mandarin that introduces the food groups and the kind of uh, foods using the Chinese healthy food pagoda. It also talks about how many grams are recommended for each group. The learners have culturally contextualized input with visual support. And then this could be compared to the US food plate, um, which is also available in Mandarin on the USDA website, with the key vocabulary right in front of the learners so that they can make statements of comparison. So let's look how we can incorporate these ideas into our teaching repertoire. So here's a unit audit I did on a short checkpoint A unit that introduces color vocabulary by looking at different flags. Now the unit you'll see has well identified communicative functions, but we can point out some areas where we might be able to engage the students more effectively. In the old unit, I used props, um, but really didn't use to incorporate any authentic resources. In some of the conversations we had weren't all that interesting or connected to real world usage. Now the use of the, oh, what is your favorite color doesn't take you very far in a conversation. Now the usage of the target flag, country flags can provide a cultural context considering the flag is a cultural product. But we, if we just stop at describing the flags, we don't get much insight into cultural perspectives. But if we talk about what those colors of the flags represent to the people, we're making an exercise of describing flags a more interesting and insightful experience. So to summarize, in auditing our current practice, we find that the way we're introducing color vocabulary now can be improved. Currently, we have no use of authentic resources. We have limited exploration of real world contexts and not all that engaging to students. It lacks a real world focus. So what might we do? Well let's look at some authentic resources that might um, beef up our idea. We could um, formulate a more interesting inquiry question and explore it, do colors communicate? And what do colors communicate? How do colors communicate? So taking our inquiry question of do colors communicate, we can start off with a very simple infographic. Now these are all, the graphics I'll show you on colors are all in Spanish, but these you have the colors introduced with the color themselves, so it's very clear what each word means, along with some ideas of um, characteristics that you might be trying to communicate with, with you uh, when you wear clothing of that color. So we start with this document using this simple graphic, and students can disagree. Are they trying to communicate these things? Most of them are cognates of English. And so it's very easy to um, engage in a conversation about this. Then we can explore further. The next graphic is a bit more complex. We can talk about colors that advertisers are using and what advertisers might communicate using different colors in their logo, logos. And again, skillful use of before, during, and after interpretive activities allows students to dig deeper into the unit inquiry question, do colors communicate? And again, off to the left, we have lists of cognates that um, these colors might symbolize and why different advertisers might choose those colors. Here's a graphic that lists personality traits associated with different colors. Uh, it's a little personality test, if you will. Uh, 
It groups many cognates as positive or negative characteristics, which some could be argued on these lists if you look at them. And then learners can decide what color best represents their personality or the personality of their friends. And then we can go to our, uh, the flags of our target language countries. And here's a graphic that compiles the meaning of colors on various flags of the world by frequency of use and frequency of meaning. Again, these use many cognates and allow for some prediction and use of reference resources to verify those predictions about what the colors might symbolize on the different flags. And again, we're using a lot of cognates here and a very simple graphic representation to get across the cultural perspective on why different colors are used in the different flags. So our revised unit with the inquiry question of do colors communicate evolves to address the standards as follows. For standard one interpretive communication, we identify feelings and uh, personality traits related to colors and in infographics. For interpersonal communication, we can express feelings, describe personality traits, and express preferences related to color choices. For our presentational communication, we describe the personality characteristic of myself and others. For our cultural products and perspective, practices and perspectives, we can identify and tell the meaning of colors of the mm -hmm. flags of the Spanish speaking world. And for cultural comparisons, we can compare the US flag to flags of other countries. So looking at what our toolbox will look like for this unit, we would use our key language function would be describe, our supporting language structures are probably going to be noun adjective agreement and singular and plural uh, nouns and our supporting of vocabulary are colors but also personal personality traits uh, countries and cognates uh, relating to values and ideals now laurie will talk to us about some specific strategies thank you bill so I'm going to talk a little bit about the task level and the unit level. Um, in particular, I'm going to share some tasks that are embedded in a unit plan. Uh, in general, when I design units, um, I, I'm always thinking about vocabulary. I'm thinking about not just the new vocabulary that I want to introduce, but also that recycled vocabulary. As Joanne mentioned, it's not just having access to vocabulary a certain number of times that helps students acquire that vocabulary, but rather the intentional use of vocabulary. So we're going to look through um, some examples from my unit on the Museo de Loro. This is the Gold Museum in Bogota, and my students take a virtual trip. So just a, a, a pitch again for thematic unit design um, and, and how effective it can be in helping students acquire vocabulary well. Um, thematic units allow for purposeful recycling, as we mentioned earlier, for vocabulary sets. So in this unit in particular, students are going to revisit direction vocabulary, food and meal taking, clothing, body parts, numbers, and colors, among others. Um, and we'll have a look at some of the, the new vocabulary uh, offered as well. So um, one of the tasks that they will be involved in is viewing a video about the food in Bogota. Uh, and they're going to be extracting from that video. So it's an interpretive listening um, activity or, or watching as well. Um, and they're going to be using the language that they hear and organizing it by meals. Um, but the next task I wanted to share with you regarding food is one that we can unpack a little bit with regard to new and recycled vocabulary. So if you look, uh, here we have an authentic resource. This is a, a takeout menu from a, um, a shop, a, a small cafe, which is actually quite close to, to the Museo del Oro in Bogota. Uh, students are given this, um, this authentic resource and they're asked to review it. They are also given a certain amount of money and you can see images of the, the bills here, um, the currency in Colombia. Um, they're given different amounts of money depending on the, the first letter of their first name. Of course, this is going to get them to choose different items and to discuss the things that they have chosen for their snack prior to going to the museum. So the new vocabulary I want to really target with this task, um, given the fact that they have different amounts of 
of money to spend uh, is language like more or less than. So yo tengo más, yo tengo menos. Um, and then there are some cultural foods here on this menu that they're going to be exposed to uh, and learn about. The recycled vocabulary or spiral vocabulary are um, specific language around the different meals, uh, general food words that they will have had prior, and of course numbers, given the fact, as I said, that they have different amounts to spend. Another task after having their snack, of course, they're going to um, explore the different regions of uh, the capital of Colombia. They're going to first learn about the Transmilenio, which is the um, public bus system uh, in Bogota, and they are exposed to this map, so they're going to have to get from one place to another. But we're going to focus in a little bit on this next task, which is a small map of La Candelaria, which is the neighborhood surrounding um, the Museum of Gold. So uh, they are going to work in pairs to get from one place to another. They're going to learn new vocabulary about particular buildings in this part of the city and some cultural place names. Again, the recycled vocabulary that we are targeting here are directions, so uh, go left, go right, go straight. Uh, again, numbers, given the fact that these uh, street names are numbered, or some of them are, and colors. Actually, the colors refers back to the Transmilenio map, um, as any good public uh, transport system does. It is color-coded, and so they get to recycle those words as well. And then body parts, which is every middle schooler's favorite topic. Uh, this is um, a great way to jump into the actual artifacts that they're going to be viewing once they're inside the museum. And so they're going to be looking at these images and uh, learning about different um, objects and what they're made of. They're also going to be filling in this particular artifact by um, adding the pieces that are missing. Um, but if we look at the next slide, we can have a look at some of the new vocabulary that they'll be learning with this task. There are adjectives of description. So not only are they describing the body parts, but they're describing each particular object. Um, and they're learning a new formulaic chunk, which is que something tan something. So in the first one, for example, que cara tan tranquila. So they're learning this particular structure, this formulaic chunk. Um, and again, the recycled vocabulary are body parts. So that's a particular look at some of the tasks that are embedded within a thematic unit. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about classroom tasks, but some of these serve two purposes. Um, they are strategies that work um, writ large in your classroom and some that are still also embedded in um, thematic units. This is my thematic unit on the Day of the Dead. Uh, and for novice students, it's often difficult to find a reading that is authentic that students can access fully. And I have experienced that and you may have as well. And so what I've ended up doing is what I call a heat map. Uh, this is a particular reading from a, um, a, a newspaper that students will access. I don't fully expect them to understand all of the language in this particular reading. And so what I ask them to do is to go home and read it and to underline or highlight uh, words that they interpret as positive in blue and words that they interpret as negative in red. Now, of course, this is going to be different for every child as every student comes to the classroom bringing different relationships with different words um, and different meanings. Uh, but what usually ends up happening is students come in the next day and most of their reading is blue. And so what they interpret from that is that the Day of the Dead is mostly a positive holiday as opposed to a negative or scary one. So that is their entry point into um, this particular task in this particular unit. And again, it's a way of editing the task, not the text. When you encounter those readings, those authentic resources, that might be at a reading level that is higher than the proficiency of your students. Another strategy, of course, is the use of cognates. Um, Joanne mentioned this earlier. And so students may already know many cognates. Um, they look at them on site and they can pretty much figure out 
uh, what they mean. We make collections of these words. Um, sometimes Bill mentioned the, the word wall. We often will collect them and put them on a wall or students have running lists of cognates that will help them. And there are lots and lots of resources and visuals online that will help start that conversation. Um, so we're always pointing out cognates in the classroom, both in our unit tasks and uh, in general. Another strategy oops, that we use uh, in my class is the use of passwords. Um, and here you see some examples in multiple languages. These uh, resources are available to you if you would like to use them. They are crudely drawn um, illustrations that I use in my own class. So passwords are useful phrases that are taught directly and then posted around the room. At the beginning of the year, I show students the collection that I have. It's roughly 50 or so of these mini posters. And they choose around 15 of them for uh, posting in the classroom. They choose the ones that they think would be most useful to them. Um, some of the students go home and color them and bring them back the next day. And then I post them around the classroom. Um, and passwords, I'm sure many of you use them already, can be really, really effective for helping students to communicate when they forget that particular functional chunk, that particular word, that particular structure to help them to communicate. And I often find my students forgetting how to say something and you notice them looking around the walls and they find it and then they're able to uh, say what they need to say and they become unstuck. So the strategy of passwords can be really, really effective. If you don't have a lot of wall space, some folks will create a strip of passwords that students can bring with them and put in front of them uh, on their desks or tape to their desks. There's lots of ways to do it. Um, so that's a strategy that I find very helpful for vocabulary. And then of course, circumlocution, um, working around a particular word so that they don't get stuck on the one lexical item that will keep them from communicating. Uh, we play games like similar to the $20,000 pyramid, if you remember that game, where students have to describe a particular word by saying it's a thing that, or it's a person who, it's a place where, or it's an animal that. In this case, this is very particular to my school and my students um, who carry their um, pencil cases around and the tiger is our school mascot. And so this has a lot of connections um, to our partic particular context, but using circumlocution is really, really valuable. I use a gesture in my class that helps remind students to circumlocute. So we integrate it not just in the tasks of units, but also in our daily classroom practice. And so my gesture is this, my students all know it. Um, they will make that gesture to each other when they feel each other getting stuck and they wanna help. Um, so they know that this means work around the word, don't get yourself stuck, but circumlocute. But it's not just enough to encourage them to do it. I also reward students uh, when they circumlocute. So gold star for circumlocution. If on an assessment they are stuck and they have a word that they really want to know, if they are able to work around it, even if that was the word I was targeting and hoping they would be able to use, they will get full credit for doing that. I actually had one student one year who was so obsessed with circumlocution that the student only circumlocuted and explicitly avoided all of the vocabulary that I was teaching. It was quite funny, but it becomes um, a, a, something that is rewarded, something that students can use. It's a skill that is highly useful um, for their future use of the language. And so, as I mentioned, lots and lots of resources are available for you to, um, to help support vocabulary in the classroom. Here are just a few. I'm sure that there are many, many more, and I encourage you to please share on our, um, on our Facebook page, uh, Facebook group. If you have other ideas, here are just some of the links that I wanted to share with you um, to help you with vocabulary. And so just to revisit today's goals, we are hopeful that you can say yes to all of these. I can identify what it means to know vocabulary. I can plan for vocabulary development through classroom communication. I can plan for vocabulary development at the unit level. And I can plan for vocabulary development through strategy instruction and intentional recycling. So at this point, I will turn it over to my colleagues um, and see, uh, I think Joanne, if there are any wonderful questions or always great questions and we're happy to answer them at this time. 
So there were quite a few um, questions, but the most recent ones come up a few times is about the Facebook group. Um, can you tell, since you're our social webmaster there, um, can you tell people the name of that Facebook group and maybe Bill can type it right into the chat? Yes. So it's world. Uh, that's a good question. Now I'm going to have to look for it. <laughs> world languages in New York State, I believe. Um, and we are happy to have people join and share resources and, and talk to one another. Um, and as soon as I quit talking, I will be happy to, if Bill, you can't find it, I will put the link in the chat as well. Okay, we'll make sure folks have it before we're done. Oh, Bill has already already Thank put it you. up there. So yes, please join. And it's a place where we're putting out information and where you can exchange information and ask us questions. So, um, oh, there's so many good questions here. Because you were just talking about cognates, I'm going to bring those up first. Uh, Deirdre Kelly brought up the idea that, you know, some students are really struggling to be able to even identify cognates. And so how do you address that situation? Deirdre actually answered her own question, which is saying that she used kind of a sing-songy voice, which is one of those high leverage teaching practice, small grain practices to bring students attention to it. Um, someone else brought in, what if they don't know the cognate? in their first language. So can you speak to those two ideas kind of collectively about cognates? Yeah, that uh, that last point is a good one. There are times when you'll be, you know, you'll it's a cognate, it's the same, and, and the student won't actually know the word in English. And this is one of those times when you've likely heard um, others say, oh, wow, you know, colleagues will say, you're our students learn this word through you. So they'll learn a word in the language classroom that they then have in English. So this is another example of how oftentimes um, learning another language helps support your, your L1, right? Um, it, in a classroom, we do a lot of what I call crowdsourcing. So it's, it's likely that not every student will recognize your cognate as a cognate but there are other students who will. And so we do a lot of crowdsourcing when students are struggling with the word, um, other students join in, so there's a lot of support. Um, and I think that's also good classroom practice to develop that classroom, uh, students helping each other. We're all in this to help each other and to, to improve in our proficiency. So um, I also do a lot of illustrating a vocabulary, keeping, as Bill said, lists of vocabulary that are personal to the students so that they have kind of, if they hear a new word, a running list where I encourage them to illustrate it. Um, and again, I think sometimes they're going to be learning a word that others have determined, others have said is a cognate. They, the students may learn that for the first time and that's going to just increase their, their L1 vocabulary as well. Okay, um, I'll turn it over to Bill to identify next questions. Um, I didn't, I saw one about besides using authentic resources, what are some other things if like if you can't find the right authentic resource. Well, again, you have all those other strategies of visuals, um, videos that video clips and advertisements, things like that, uh, images, pictures, those those you can create um, scenarios. You know, I know people who, when they introduce clothing vocab, they'll get us bring a suitcase and pull things out of it and things like that. So you can still use all of those things as well. And a lot of times, like um, going to websites for stores, you can find all sorts of stuff um, that, again, those are mostly nouns. How do you find adjectives and other parts of speech? Some of those, um, like verbs, you can use good old TPR, just uh, act them out um, as possible. So there's, the authentic resources can and the interpretive activities are one form of input and you can add to all of your other um, input strategies that you use. Um, any other, Laurie or Joanne, you wanna add on to that um, yeah. idea? Yeah, absolutely. I, I love the I love having physical objects in the classroom. So as much as we are very much a digital society now, and especially with remote teaching, we've become very reliant on digital. But now that we're back in the classroom, I've made a concerted effort to bring objects to students, um, sometimes real, sometimes fake, you know, 
fake fruit, you know, toys, um, manipulatives, things that they can touch and hold. So that usually um, is, is can support language uh, vocabulary acquisition quite well. Um, I'm also still a huge fan of music um, and song lyrics with students, which again, I will tend to illustrate. I will target certain words. Not all of the song is going to be comprehensible, but certain um, groups of words uh, and, and help students kind of learn that those particular words via images that are, you know, kind of glossed on the side. So not in, you know, target language English gloss, but rather target language image gloss so that students can get a sense for some of the, the language in the songs. So I'm going to jump in here. First of all, it is five o'clock and the session is from four to five. So you are more than welcome to log off, but we'll keep we'll stay on and keep answering questions till they're all answered. So feel free to stay as well. Um, there were actually several questions about authentic resources. So I'm going to bring in some of the other ones and I'm going to add to the answers you just gave. Um, one of the things I want to remind people about is that this is one of many workshops that are all recorded. And one of our very first workshops was given by Leslie Gron, or first two workshops by Leslie Gron at the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021, in which she talked about um, authentic resources for these various purposes. And so you might really want to go back and watch those if you haven't had the opportunity, because you'll get many more ideas and strategies for finding them, curating them, applying them into lessons, and particularly for the purposes of vocabulary learning, because she did a whole section on that. Um, I will point out some of you are very much aware that we are um, beginning a process of having people identify or create, excuse me, unit plan exemplars that will be published. We're starting with checkpoint A, and then we'll be um, moving to FLESS in the fall and checkpoints B and C in the spring, all of which will be built on um, authentic resources. And so you'll have many, many examples to refer to in terms of authentic resources being integrated for um, interpretive purposes and vocabulary acquisition. Um, so some of the other questions about authentic resources. Somebody asked, what if we can't find comprehensible authentic resources? And someone asked, can we simplify authentic texts? So I wondered if one of you wanted to respond to those two questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll go. Well, just simplifying, sometimes just taking one part of it as is, is enough to just crop it down and just focus on the one part that you need. I think that's preferable too. And then like Lori's heat map activity um, was a great example of just taking a, 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 a thing that looks overwhelming at first and breaking it down, to, just have them find the words, find the cognates and things like that. And that's sufficient. You don't have to do all the other ceremonies that of interpretive activities, you can just, that's enough. It gives you the, the vocab you need to continue with the, um, with the uh, communicative function that you're targeting. Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. And, and I would say that um, taking material that's a little bit more advanced than your students that you know they're not going to fully comprehend is, is good for several things. Again, using a strategy like the heat map or using circling cognates or even just you know responding to a, a very quick section of it that you think they can understand is good. I also like it because it shows students that they do not have to understand an entire text fully that they don't need to understand every word. And we do have students who are very, very um, set and fixated on, you know, I don't understand this one word and so that's that. And so by exposing them over and over again to material that is not fully comprehensible, we're gonna start to desensitize them to that. We're gonna keep them trying and pulling out of things, uh, of texts, things that they understand. For example, uh, I'm in New York City, we have Spanish, I'm a Spanish teacher, we have Spanish all around us. I encourage my students to be constantly looking at signs and reading and pulling out one word that they know, bring it to me the next day, take a picture, share with me what they saw and they don't know anything but that one word. So this must be about, I don't know, 
cats, a cat adoption, right? And of course, there'll be an image to help support it, but they've saw the word gatos and they're able to make that connection. So the more, you, and, and that's good for us to be thinking about too, because that's going to be with authentic materials. It's very rare that you'll find something that is 100% comprehensible for our students. So it's good to be thinking about different things you can do with the materials that we find. And I'll add that our performance indicators are really useful for this process of task design because they remind us what level of performance we can expect from our students. And when we allow our students to view those performance indicators, when we communicate them to them, they know, oh, I'm only expected to be able to, um, you know, communicate in words and memorized phrases or to be able to communicate in a single sentence um, or understand the main idea. So again, that allows for realistic task design and realis realistic expectations on part the part of the students. There was another question about above about um, how do you know to choose what what words go with novices, what words go with intermediates and what words are more advanced and um, one of the things that I, one of the things that I often consult is there's a whole body of linguistics called corpus linguistics where they analyze different kinds of 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 literature and resources and stuff like that and do frequency lists and there's actually a frequency dictionary of your language out there and I have the frequency dictionary and so I'll just look at that and see if it's in the first thousand first two thousand first three thousand words and that can give that gives me an idea of ballpark idea of of what that is and of course when you have a language that's taught in many different countries one one country will have a word for this one country will have a word for this i try and pick the one that is going to give the broadest um usage you know the the one that will be understood even if it's not the specific word that they use in that country for that specific article the one that they'll understand you know from the, they're more likely understand in the most places it's kind of a scattershot approach but it's um it's how i deal with that dilemma of you know just whose Spanish do you teach? Just whose French are you teaching? You know, the, I'm going to give them the words that are going to get the most bang for their buck in the most places that they're going to end up in and try and make that as a judgment call. The other thing, trying to have conversations, and I, I'm not sure how much you can codify because of the personalized nature of vocabulary, how much you can control, you know, what gets cut, what gets covered in level checkpoint a versus what gets covered in checkpoint b but you know i think there i think it's worthwhile to attempt that and again my way of course i was you know everything from levels two to five in my uh, when i taught and so i had my vocabulary list for every unit every uh, level and so i could see and i would purposefully recycle vocabulary you know over and over from year to year and then even within the year from unit to unit so um, if you can have those conversations and those collegial collaborations that certainly can make it easier for students to um, uh, make it make the way more smooth for the students someone was asking about um curated uh, authentic resources that students could listen to and so I want to point out that one of our tasks that we're working on right now is to add more authentic resources that can be listened to auditory resources to the wakelet. So that's a current endeavor. And on the wakelet, um, there is a suggestion box. And so if you happen to know of some great authentic resources for listening, which we know of some, but we're always um, open to more suggestions, feel free to go to the Wakelet and just enter it in and we will take a look at it and see. Yes, absolutely, Beth, I appreciate. Um, the University of Texas has some amazing resources, um, but we will continue to work on that aspect of the Authentic Resources Wakelet as well. Um, I'm looking to see if there's, um, there were a couple questions, a couple people not feeling overly comfortable with the idea of developing inquiry questions and knowing when to use them in a lesson plan or in, in, a, in a unit, I guess. Um, so would one of you like to respond to that question? Some are different. 
I, I still play, I still struggle with this myself. I'll tell you right out. And I, it's still something that I've, I'm exploring and playing with and a lot of trial and even more error um, in terms, sometimes my inquiry question just gets completely lost and we go down a different track as the unit unfolds. And that's, you know, I just throw up my hands and say, that's where we were that's supposed to go right. with it. And, uh, that's where it happens. But you can either take your inquiry question, like the color one, you could take that and have a kind of an ongoing thing. And as you, you can represent the question with each authentic resource that you interpret. Um, others, you can kind of build up to a, a culminating activity where you actually consider it. And again, you're trying to always pick an inquiry question that can be handled answered by the students so you know what do do colors communicate well that's basically a yes or no question <laughs> then you'd say how right and uh, what do they communicate what does red communicate to you so you can give them red communicates this or red says this and then all those words that we've been exploring throughout the unit so you can break it down at the level of proficiency that the students have and they, i think that's the hard part that's where i struggle too you get you get like kind of a juicy question and then you go okay now how are they going to be able to answer with the language that they have within the boundaries of the proficiency um expectations that we have for that that level and that's the trick and, and it's i think it's kind of a new way of thinking so i think we're all kind of inventing it uh, colleagues what do you think uh, can, yeah can i uh, unmute can I unmute Bill? It's Tiffany. Hi. <laughs> I was one of them. I just, I wanted to clarify what I meant with that. I think I have a really great understanding of how to put the units together and the activities to do, but your overarching question of do colors communicate? I thought that was awesome, creative, engaging. And then when I look at your activities, there are four different activities within the, or four different authentic resources in one unit. And I feel like where I'm getting stuck is I have to find authentic resources that flow. Do you see what I mean? It's, it's, I, that's where I'm struggling. So then when I see your overarching question of do colors communicate, and then I look at your four separate activities, I think, oh, wow, I can do that. But then when I sit down to do it, I can't do it. I am struggling with maybe that creative overarching aside from, you know, the four learning parts, it's been a long two weeks, my brain is gone, but you know, the, the four overarching questions that you had for each separate document, does that make sense? Yeah, I think that for me, it always comes up like I, I my own process is I get my anchor topic first. And then I start with my anchor topic and I look at the related topics. Then I, before I really come up with my inquiry question, I start looking to see what's out there. So I, before I came up with that inquiry question, I had found those graphics just by searching, you know, colors. And then I found something I thought, oh, colors communicate. Let's try that. And, and so the more I start to do the searches for the documents, that's where the documents started to pop. And then that's where the idea was formed. And that's so oftentimes how my process works. It's in the search for the documents that I end up coming up with, with the, uh, the, 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 the hook. And um, uh, it's just amazing that uh, that's why I'm so sold on the resources. I think resources why I'm pushing because they really, for me, I would have never thought to go in that direction, but then when I saw that thing with the logos, it was like, oh, you know, the sky opened up and then there, and the, the resource itself said, the website was, they came from was called uh, uh, Colors Communicate, Colores Comunicand, and that was it. It was, you know, there it was. It was just handed to me on a silver platter, just in the search for the authentic resources. So I'll just add, you know, there's no magic number of authentic resources. You know, one of the things that we attempt to do in these workshops is to give you multiple examples to bring the points home. And so you can use, and as a matter of fact, you, if you find a quality authentic resource, use it over and over, milk it for all it's worth. You know, it can start with looking at the cognates and identifying, you know, what this is about, what's that main idea and coming back to it for understanding it culturally. And so there's, there's no need to collect this large quantity of authentic resources. You know, I remind you, we have our 
you know, authentic resource wakelet, but Leslie Grant, I mean, she's, she, her Pinterest page, if you want a topic, you know, if you want to look at colors in German, well, she's going to have umpteen authentic resources that are about colors in German, and you may find a whole set that are already curated for you. Um, so I wouldn't worry so much about that. And I actually want to go back to um, a question earlier that one of you was was responding to, which is like, you know, how do we find authentic resources that aren't just about nouns, but are also about verbs and adjectives? That goes back to what Bill was just saying about how you search. So I remember last year, one of my student teachers was teaching around um, leisure activities. And so he went searching for like what teens do in their free time. And because he searched for what they do, he came up with incredible authentic resources about adolescents in different Spanish speaking countries. He was preparing to be a Spanish teacher and their activities, which were all verbs. And then the students were able to identify which ones they expected to see, which ones they do, which ones they'd like to learn how to do, um, and then multiple passes through the authentic resource. Um, I there was another, oh, go on, Lori. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say that, you know, the whole inquiry question, finding a good one and finding all those resources is definitely more art than science. Um, it is, it is, is a creative endeavor. Um, and I really encourage folks to work in at least pairs, if possible, if not a larger group, because kind of, again, with the crowdsourcing, getting a lot of different perspectives on the material, on what you're trying to accomplish, can really come, you can come up with some very, very interesting things because you're not always gonna see things in the same way. So those multiple perspectives in this work can be super helpful. Another uh, question area that came up a couple of uh, folks talked like how much is enough and how much, how many words, and I, I try not to get caught up in a number personally, um, like some groups, like when you do foods, I mean, a lot of them are cognates and they're easy and you, you can do a lot of them. Others are more challenging if it's beyond, a little beyond their experience. Like I know when I used to do things like transportation, like where you're in the airport and stuff where the kids didn't necessarily have the experience to go with it. You had to kind of scale it back a little bit. Um, so I think the topic a lot of times dictated how much I could push in, as far as vocab, but also the, um, uh, you, you have to, I always have to rein myself in too and, and just say, okay, what do we really need? What do I want them to produce for the language function? I have to always go back to those language functions. What do I want them to be able to produce? And what are they going to need to produce that? You know, and then which ones will I want them to recognize when they re reoccur in readings, those receptive words, and then the personal words that they're gonna to need to do uh, presentational tasks. So that that kind of reigns me in. And I'll, I'm a constantly recycling past vocab. I think we have answered the questions. Is there anybody else who has one last burning question? Well, thank you all so very, very much for being here today. We look forward to seeing you at future events and all of our resources will be posted in the handouts folder. Bill, can you paste that in one more time? Um, sure. And the, then, and the okay. document, it's already in there. So if you go to the documents folder, it's already, the PD, I've already slid the PDF in there and uh, you can look at it right away and click on the links. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have Bill, a good rest of the day. Uh, Bill, um, so uh, hi, this is um, Heidi. We met a few years back. Um, I have a question regarding the vocabulary that you're talking about. Um, so it seems to me kind of like that in the vocabulary that's absolutely necessary to get the point across is almost like the grammar part. And then you have all those other things like adjectives or verbs that help the student like use that. Do you know what I mean? Like, because uh, I'm like new teacher. So 
I'm still trying to like figure it all out. <laughs> so well, that's what it's seeming like to me. Like it, if I'm teaching them, like, like right now I'm teaching them the me gusta and the me gusta part, like that's really what I want them to learn. The me gusta, no le gusta, you know, me gusta, te gusta, no le gusta, blah, blah, blah. And then everything else is like the accessories for them to be able to communicate. You know what I mean? Use that. Right. And that's where those, the, you're, you're giving them chunks, functional chunks. So they really are like a vocabulary, but they serve the fun, they serve us the function of uh, gra grammar as well. You, you, our next two workshops are all about grammar. So hopefully you'll be able to join us for those as well. And that'll give you some additional strategies and maybe help clarify thinking about that. And again, there's a fine line. It's not, there's not a definite, this is vocabulary and this is grammar is there's not like this great, um, you know, wall between them. They, they go back and forth, but we do have boxes to fill in on our, on our year plan. So, you know, we, we talk about where, what to put where. And so, yeah, so you can have what you might consider vocabulary as terms of functional chunks that'll be in your vocab, that'll be in your, the grammar section of your unit plan, as well as the groups of vocabulary that'll be in your vocabulary section. Oh, yes, I understand what you're saying. I, I do include that, those, that, those, what are they called? Functional chunks? Yeah. Those functional chunks, I do include them in the, in the, they're on my quote unquote vocab list. Yep. You know, so mine, mine too. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So thank you. I, 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 I appreciate so much all your knowledge. Um, I, I really appreciate it. I've learned so much from you um, and all these uh, webinars. Thank you so much for giving them. <laughs> thank you for coming. Thank I'll you echo so that. Thank you, Joan, Lori, and Bill for a wonderful workshop. And thank you to all the staff who helped facilitate this event. All attendees will receive either a certificate of attendance or a CTLE certificate within 24 hours. You'll also receive a workshop badge. When you receive your badge, consider adding it to your email signature or posting it to social media to spread the word about world language professional learning. The recording of this workshop and the accompanying post assessments will be made available on the OBEWL professional learning website within about a week from today. The registration forms for the February through May workshops are available. Please consider bookmarking our professional learning page so that you can keep up to date with our new offerings. Thank you for attending and have a wonderful weekend.